making headlines tonight. Child kidnapped from Gumpala found in Batiklo. First at 9, this is Other Therana 24-7. 24-hour GMO strike ends. Trade unions cannot topple a government with people's mandate. Prime Minister warns of action. US equity firm pulls out of bid talks for Sri Lankan Airlines. In international headlines, French election, Emmanuel Macron's campaign hacked. Good evening and a warm welcome to your news at 9. We take a look at your top story tonight. It is a day of relief for the parents of kidnapped Rinas Mohammed Salman as he was found today in Batiklo. The child was kidnapped from Gampola in Kandy district last Wednesday. Police arrested an acquaintance of the family along with two other women at a fishing shelter in Karadiyanaru where the child was held. Rinas Mohammed Salman, aged two years and eight months, and a 26-year-old acquaintance of the child were kidnapped in Gangavata Gampola on their way to a nearby shop. Later in the day, the father of the child received a telephone call demanding a ransom of 3 million rupees. Later, the ransom was reduced to 1 million rupees. The family acquaintance, however, was found in candy yesterday, allegedly released by the kidnappers. Following a complaint lodged by the mother of Rina Salman, police deployed three special teams in Colombo and Gaul in search of the child. The operation was based on information obtained from the release family acquaintance. The police, however, found the child at a fishing shelter in Karadiyanaru Batikalo this morning. <laughs> The family acquaintance, who was alleged to have been kidnapped and later released, was apprehended under suspicion of masterminding the kidnapping. The police has also arrested a woman and her daughter who were at the shelter where the child was found. The child was returned to his father by the police while a medical examination confirmed Rina Salman to be in good health. Police say further investigations continue in search of the rest of the culprits involved in the kidnapping. President Maitripala Sirisena emphasizes that the constitution, law and order and power are shaped on the personal attributes of the very individuals wielding the powers. The president made these remarks at the 33rd Chief Minister's Summit held in Habarana today. The 33rd Chief Minister's Summit was conducted under the patronage of President Maitripala Sirisena. Chief Ministers representing all nine provinces participated in the summit. Meanwhile, the chairmanship for the next summit was awarded to North Central Provincial Council. Accordingly, the incumbent chairman, Chief Minister of the North Central Province, Peshala Jaratna, passed the chairmanship to Chief Minister of North Western Province, Dharma Siridasanayaka, before the President. Palat Sabha Saha Rajayatara Kataitu Karanavita Mamadano Yam Yam Matavadi Lisa Prasna Tibeno. When the government and provincial councils work together, I know that there are ideological, constitutional problems as well as issues related to the law. Mitharamulla disaster was an example where dozens of innocent lives were lost. I believe the conflict between line ministries and provincial councils was one of the leading reasons behind the disaster. The final goal of all of our efforts must be to provide services to the public and expedite the economic processes of the nation. According to my experience, the form of the constitution, law and order and power are being shaped by characteristics, spirituality and knowledge of the person who are wielding power. There's a dialogue on the provincial council system. This is a time in which we are looking at forming a new constitution while considering devolution of power. In this aspect, I wish to achieve our economic goals. Mama 
Meanwhile, President Maitripala Sirisena congratulated Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi yesterday on the successful launch of a new communication satellite by India. The launch ca uh, carries special significance to Sri Lanka since it is designed to be utilized by the members of SARC countries. Speaking to the Indian Premier via satellite, the President added that the launch was a historic milestone in cooperation and development among SARC nations even signifies your intent and commitment to build cordial, friendly and inclusive ties with the countries of South Asia. The president added that he believed this satellite would help to uplift the economic and social standard of the people. Launched yesterday from the Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sri Harikota, the South Asia satellite is a geosynchronous communications and meteorology satellite which is expected to help in meeting the growing telecommunications and broadcasting needs of the region. The satellite will offer television services, communication technology for banks and for e-governance and provide communication channels for better coordination during disaster management. All SARC countries except for Pakistan have signed up to make use of the satellite. Police have be beefed up security ahead of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Sri Lanka. Indian Premier will visit Sri Lanka next week to inaugurate the UN International Day of Vesak celebrations scheduled from the 12th to the 14th of May. High-level security measures were taken by Sri Lanka police to provide protection for Honorable Prime Minister of India during his state visit in Sri Lanka during next week. Over 6,000 police personnel were deployed to secure all the venues and en routes which Honorable Indian Prime Minister scheduled to visit in Colombo and Tilkan. Under the personal guidance and the instructions of the Inspector General of Police, Mr. Fuji Jayasundar, all these security measures were organized. And the island-wide 24-hour trade union action headed by the Government Medical Officers Association concluded today at 8 a.m. Vesting sight uh, on the public, uh, abstention from entering into pacts malignant to the country and non-privatization of government institutions were the major demands of the trade unions. Following the conclusions of the strike, Adhidirana looked into the functions of the National Hospital. The patients there were not impressed with the strike. We have nothing to say about doctors. They are anyway being paid by the government. What they do is very wrong. The government is very unfair. No one was affected except the public. Even though the strike was called off around 8 a.m., railway services at the fort, Maradana and Ragam railway stations were dysfunctional. The government and the officials are taking revenge from the public. The public is very intelligent now. No one can deceive the public. Within such a backdrop, the former president Mahinda Rajapaksa said the strike was a success, addressing a function in Mathura last evening. I think it's a very successful strike. The joint opposition's opinion regarding this issue is fair. The joint opposition is working according to the public's need. There wouldn't have been a strike had I been in power since a need to strike would not have arisen. Speaking on the matter, Chairman of the Government Nursing Officers Association, Saman Ratnapriya expressed a different view of the trade union action to that of the former president. A gigantic strike was called yesterday, 200 trade unions were on the register. But we did not see 200 trade unions in action and it never happened in Sri Lanka. So we requested every employee not to participate in this. 90% of them reacted accordingly. Minister of Education Akila Viraj Karyavasam, however, highlighted the impact of the strike on school children. It can be the GMOA or any other union. You cannot put these children's lives in danger to fulfill narrow political agendas. We should love ourselves and our children, irrespective of our political views. In the meantime, media spokesperson of the GMOA, Dr. Samantha Ananda, revealed they will resort to another trade union action if the government fails to respond. 
Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe says trade unions cannot topple a legitimate government, warning that strong action will be taken. He expressed these remarks while participating in an event organized by activists on development of the Badala district. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank all the government officers who engaged in work yesterday. There are professional issues for the people who are working in the government and the private fields. There are many ways to solve this problem through discussion, seeking help from court, and some are engaged in protesting. The government is trying to solve it through discussions. Therefore, for trade unions, it is difficult to discourage a government which has been elected by the people's choice. Therefore, we are strongly against the trade unions for using their power and we are taking strong actions against it. In the next election, people can propose their alternative suggestions and decide who should come to power. There are ways to solve professional issues. <laughs> Prime Minister also spoke about national policy framework of the government. We have agreed on many development programs by discussing with India and Japan. We have also spoken to China. It is only now the national policy framework is complete. If we want to go forward as a country, we should develop the country. There is a huge development zone from Kandy to Hambantota. There is development in these areas. We were able to develop the other parts of the country with that strength. We are discussing with Japan about Kandy. We are implementing a development program in Kaluthara and Gaul as well. We are also looking forward for the southwestern development. On the other hand, we are looking forward to tourism in eastern areas. We are already making plans for that. In your business news, U.S. private equity firm TPG, one of the three biggest or bidders shortlisted to buy a 49% stake in state-owned Sri Lankan Airlines has pulled out of talks about the potential acquisition. According to Reuters news agency chairman of the national carrier, Ajit Dias said in an internal memo to employees that after completing their due diligence process, TPG informed the management that they will not pursue a potential investment in Sri Lankan Airlines. According to Reuters, Ajit Dias has told Sri Lankan Airlines employees that it is TPG's opinion that allocating the human and financial resources to make the airline profitable will not realize sufficient returns compared to the many other investment opportunities that are available to them. TPG, Sri Lanka-based Peace Air and a Maldivian company had been shortlisted from about nine bids for the 49% stake, including from U.S. investment manager BlackRock Incorporation. The government called for bids in July and had expected to award the restructuring process by end 2016. Adit Dias has also said the government was pursuing other options to find a partner. Earlier this week, Sri Lankan Airlines announced its group losses, recording 6.49 billion rupees for the financial year before finance and one-off changes. When contacted, Deputy Minister of Public Enterprises Development, Iran Vikramaratne, told us that the government will negotiate directly with airlines in a bid to find a strategic partner after TPG ended talks for investment in the national carrier. It was an international uh, private equity fund. After its due diligence, it decided that it would uh, not uh, want to continue the process and that process came to an end. The reasons are differ from one company to the other. Everybody, when they put their investments as their own criteria, and they look at their own strategy and see how the strategy of the investing company matches with it, and they come to their own decision. So that process is now complete and over. Therefore, now we have the freedom to talk directly to international airlines. Two airlines, international airlines, we have had a preliminary discussion. We cannot come into any conclusions because it is, everything is now at a very preliminary stage. But we will pursue looking for partners, whether they are investors or partners in terms of matching services and seeing whether Sri Lanka Airlines could benefit out of any partnership. 
Also in local business news, if the Sri Lankan economy can create enough opportunities to use the expertise and the experience of expatriates, Sri Lanka will have the benefit of repatriation of capital. The governor of the central bank, Indrajit Kumaraswamy, made these comments while launching the central bank report for the year 2016 recently. One is to try to get them to remit money, but probably the more useful thing is to try to get them back. Because I think if the economy can create enough opportunities to be able to use their expertise and experience, uh, then I think you, you have the repatriation of that capital. The governor, Kumar Swami, also expressed his views about the negative growth of the agriculture sector last year. There's a negative growth in agriculture sector. What's the central bank perspective on that? One of the factors which are constraining the growth potential of the economy is the low productivity in agriculture. We are, in my view, trapping a lot of people in low productivity, low income economic activity, higher productivity, higher income employment opportunities. Then you would need to shift people. <laughs> Oil prices have stabilized after hitting fresh five-month lows in early trade today amid renewed concerns over a worldwide production surplus. After falling sharply on Thursday, Brent crude fell 47.4 dollars per barrel at one point before recovering to 49.14 dollars. Prices are still around their lowest level since November when the OPEC oil producers group agreed to cut output. Investors are worried that OPEC nations will fail to rein in output further at their next meeting later this month. The price of US crude also dropped sharply but then recovered to stand at $46.28 a barrel. Oil prices are down by about 15% since the start of the year despite OPEC's agreements in November which cut output by 1.8 million barrels a day. Sur surplus is still outpacing demand with US oil production alone up by 10% since summer 2016. It now pumps out some 9.3 million barrels a day, not far short of the two giant oil producing nations of Russia and Saudi Arabia. Also making international business news, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said in a letter that he will consider a ban on thermal coal shipments from the United States as a trade dispute between the North American neighbours heats up. The move is a shift for Trudeau, who until now has been telling U.S. officials that bilateral trade irritants are minor and both nations benefit from having integrated production. U.S. President Donald Trump stopped trade tensions last week by slapping duties on softwood lumber imports from Canada while threatening to take action against Canadian dairy over what the U.S. says are unfair subsidies. Canadian media say Trudeau is also considering other trade actions against the United States. Welcome back in your sports stories. Uh, in school rugby, Trinity College Candy beat St. Joseph's College Maradana by five points in the inter-school rugby tournament. The match was played at the Havelock Park yesterday. Trinity College took an early lead with Rishen Maad in a scoring of their very first line out. St. Joseph's College showed promise early on, replying with a try of their own. Chatura Senaviratna and Sachit Silva added the extra, giving the Josephians a surprise lead of 17 to 15 at half time. In the second half, Trinity College. And in football, Argentina captain Lionel Messi has rejected Barcelona's opening contract offer, understood to be between 30 to 35 million euros per season. The 29 year old's current deal expires in June 2018. FIFA early today lifted a four-match ban on Messi, allowing him to play in the next three World Cup qualifiers. He was banned for insulting a referee's assistant. Messi already served one match of the four-match ban that was imposed when the FIFA disciplinary committee gave its ruling hours before Argentina's 2-0 loss in Bolivia in March. 
Argentina's next World Cup qualifier is in Uruguay on the 31st of August. And in tennis, top seed Pablo Carino Busta has advanced to the semi-finals of the Estoril Open, but second seed Richard Cascais suffered an exit at the hands of South Africa's Kevin Anderson. The South African was able to save a match point in the third set after losing the second to Gasquet. Anderson fought back, taking the match via a tiebreak 6-2, 3-6, 7-6. World number 21 Carreño Busta had a far easier time of it against Nicolas Almagro, winning 6-2, 6-4 in 71 minutes. Carreño Busta will play David Ferrer in the semi-finals and Kevin Anderson takes on third seed Gilles Muller. And moving back to football, Tottenham lost vital ground in the Premier League title chase, suffering defeat to West Ham United last night. The North London side remained four behind, but Chelsea now have a game in hand, which means two wins will hand the title to the Blues. Spurs could have narrowed the gap to a point at London Stadium, but West Ham keeper Adrian was in fine form. Harry Kane, Christian Eriksen and Eric Dyer were all denied and the home team were inevitably able to capitalise. Manuel Lanzini swooped on a loose ball in the Spurs area and drove home what could be a nail in the coffin of Tottenham's title hopes. And in your international headline-making story, France faces a choice between liberalism and nationalism tomorrow in a showdown between novice centrist Emmanuel Macron and far-right leader Marine Le Pen. How does the French presidential election system work and what does France have in store for the world? We take a look. Unlike many, the French election becomes a two-step process if a candidate does not secure an absolute majority in the first round. Eleven candidates were listed on the ballot for the vote, which was held on the 23rd of April this year. While French elections are usually a two-horse race between the Conservative Republicans' party and the left-wing Socialist party, this year marks a deviation from the norm. This time, incumbent President François Hollande's Socialist party has been in tatters after his disastrous term and the Republicans' François Fillon suffered from a scandal over giving his wife a fictitious job. Centrist Emmanuel Macron emerged as winner of the first round, trailed by far-right Marine Le Pen, hoping to ride the populist wave created by Brexit and Donald Trump further west. The second round of the election will now be fought by the leading pair, with the country now afforded the option to redistribute votes. Macron has been polled the favourite and has been endorsed by two defeated first-round candidates. Voting takes place tomorrow from 8am to 7 or 8pm local time. And with the French presidential election right around the corner, frontrunner Emmanuel Macron's campaign alleges that it has been the target of a massive coordinated hacking attack after a trove of documents was released online. The campaign said it was clear that hackers wanted to undermine Macron ahead of tomorrow's second round vote to determine the next president of France. About 9 gigabytes of data, including internal campaign documents, emails and financial data from candidate Emmanuel Macron's campaign were leaked on a file-sharing website late yesterday. The campaign said in a statement that genuine files were mixed with fake files in order to confuse people. The leak appears to have been timed just before campaigning officially ended at midnight, at which point both campaigns and the media face a blackout. France's election commission warned that publication or republication of the leaked information could be a criminal offence. Centrist Emmanuel Macron is due to face far-right Marine Le Pen in tomorrow's second round of elections, with pollsters giving Macron a 62% chance of winning. However, polls have also suggested an increase in voter abstention, with France's left disappointed at their lack of representation and the choice they now face. 
And moving over to the United States, the U.S. House of Representatives voted yesterday to repeal former President Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act and replace it with a Republican health care plan built the American Health Care Act. The AHCA must, however, receive Senate approval to seal the repeal and replacement of Obamacare. Let's now take a closer look at the two systems. Unveiled in 2010, Obamacare controversially made health insurance mandatory for all Americans, with transgressors facing tax penalties. The American Health Care Act repeals the mandate, however, uninsured individuals face surcharges on their premiums. Obamacare prohibits insurers from charging more or denying coverage to individuals who have pre-existing medical conditions. Controversially, the AHCA allows states to let insurers charge sick people as much as they like, however allocating $8 billion to help high-risk patients. Obamacare expanded Medicaid health insurance for the poor to cover more low-income individuals, however the AHCA phases out Medicaid expansion to reduce federal funding on the program. The AHCA has been projected to strip insurance from over 24 million Americans, but the system is expected to undergo more fine-tuning for the sake of widening appeal. Democrats have called the bill a massive wealth transfer from the middle class to the rich and to large corporations, and several demonstrations have been held across the U.S. protesting against the change. And more than 100 prisoners are still at large on the Indonesian island of Sumatra following a mass breakout from an overcrowded jail. About 200 prisoners escaped yesterday after being let out of cells for prayers and just over one-third of them have since been captured. Footage aired on local media showed dozens of men rushing out of a side entrance of the prison in Pekanbaru city with no sign of anyone pursuing them. Only five or six guards had been placed on duty for nearly 1,900 inmates in a prison supposed to hold only 300. Inmates had previously accused some guards of being violent and complained about their treatment in the facility. Hundreds of police officers and military personnel have now been deployed to guard the prison. Police have set up roadblocks around the city and are searching for the other escapees. <laughs> And on to your weather forecast for tomorrow. Now, showers or thunder showers will occur at several places in most provinces of the island during the afternoon hours. Showers can be expected in coastal areas of the southern and western provinces during the morning hours as well. Fairly heavy falls of about 75 millimeters can be expected at some places, particularly in the western, Sabragamo, central, northwestern, north central, and southern provinces. Here's a look at your city-by-city -city weather forecast for the next 24 hours. And that's all from the other than a 24-7 news center. And before we go, we'd like to leave you with some visuals from Jaffna, Sri Lanka's 12th largest city, strategically located and known for rich cultural heritage and natural beauty. Jaffna is endowed with many iconic sites from its characteristic palmyra trees and its imposing Dutch fort to the revered Nallur Kovil. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Adhaverana 24-7.